you either, again, at the whiteboard, at the chalkboard, <laughs> talking to yourself, talking to your friend, or you're yes. doing a bunch of practice problems until you really, really get it. Yes. Practice, I don't want to say it doesn't make perfect, but it makes permanent. Permanent. So you have to do it over and over and over again to really grasp it. So chemistry is not easy. Math not easy. All these physics, not easy. You just have to sit there and do problems and go to office hours. Talk to the professors. They actually will give you even more advice outside of just the classroom. So I think those are what's really stuck for me. Thank you so much. The general stereotype is a scientist has a very sort of certain image. So let's talk about image for a second. My name is Dr. Corey Grayson. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan, and this is How I Science. I remember my father telling me, you know, he was like, you aren't what I thought of when I thought of a scientist, but now you are. And so just having even that thought within the community and kind of changing our perceptions of ourselves and how we see each other in STEM. And so it's about representation. So even with, you know, this is what a scientist looks like. It's not about the actual physical image, but it's sometimes the unseen ones that we don't even know about the story, maybe even our, our disabilities that we can't see that isn't always talked about or represented in the STEM field. And so for me, it's just showing like, here I am, I'm Corey, I'm bringing my authentic self to the table and I am human. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I said, I was like, is it all going to be completely audio or is it going to be, you're going to take both. it? Yep, okay. It's going to be both. It's going to be both. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome I think to I took a shower today. Sorry. Yeah, you, you look great. You look good. All right. Welcome to Kevin on Podcast. I have a sister from another mister, Dr. Corey Grayson, coming on Kevin on the Podcast to come through and talk about just an amazing thing that she's doing in the science field or maybe just what she's doing just in general. Uh, Corey, uh, me and her go way back. Uh, go ahead and tell us what's our connection real quick. Norfolk State University, we told. The green and gold, you know what I'm saying? And so Norfolk State is not in the country, it's not in the city, it's in between in the seven cities, one of the best HBCUs. Um, and we have a great connection because we were both in science majors. We were science majors. She was in a really dope program called Denemis. I was in an honors program adjacent to that. We're all in the same pool, same teachers. And so Corey's here today to talk about her yesterday. I'm just joking. How you doing, Corey? <laughs> I am doing good. How about you? It's supposed to be I think, hot this weekend, so I'm looking forward to that. And what what state are you in right now? In Virginia. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you was in Michigan for a while. I was. I was there doing my postdoc. All right. I'm mad at you now because we never connected. So what happened? I didn't know you were there until after I left. That's why you know me. Because I'm pretty public about where, I, where I'm at, what institutions I'm at. So audience, you can see who's more famous, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> After Norfolk State, she shot up like an exponential. I shot up like a linear equation, but we still came back together. Dr. Okay, Grayson, Dr. Doing. Grayson, I'm just playing. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just so happy to get you on this podcast. You are um, an advocate for just people, an advocate for women, an advocate for black people, an advocate for HBCU people, an advocate for STEM, right? Like, like. There was that was there's I had I read this article about like just the saturation of like science majors, right? Because there was this huge push, right? Because Silicon Valley, uh actually during like 2012 or 2000, you know, during that bubble, actually no, 2012 to like 2020, Silicon Valley was making money, right? Mm -hmm. And so the government was like, oh, let's incentivize more computer scientists, right? And then two years, like for a year from now, like, you know, they're not going bankrupt. Most of the companies are going bankrupt. And now we have an oversaturation of computer scientists or just science majors. Right. And mm -hmm. I know me, like I kind of jumped on that STEM bandwagon because I was like, I could get money in this. I'm a little mm -hmm. bit of nerd. I was always a nerd and I need to make sure I pay for my tuition. So let me do physics. Right. And then mm -hmm. I kind of just fell in love with it. But for you, 
were you like always like sciencey or you just was like, you know, I picked it up, you know, mm -hmm. as an opportunity or you, you was in physics like at fifth grade? Oh, yeah. oh no, not, not, not at all. And I tell <laughs> people <laughs> all the time that I didn't know that I wanted to pursue, pursue STEM related anything until probably high school. So most of my life, I grew up playing sports, doing basketball, track, did a little bit of volleyball. So, you know, thinking more of like, okay, I might be more of an athlete. And then I really enjoyed photography. I took a photography mm. class in high school, still enjoy photography. And those are like the two things that I wanted. And I, at one point I thought I was going to be a masseuse and, you know, massage celebrities. And the other part I thought I was going to be, you know, a physical or a chiropractor, actually, physical therapist, chiropractor. So I was kind of in the medical field-ish, yeah. but I talked to a chiropractor. He's like, it's more of like learning how to run a business. And he's like, that's more kind of what it is. And I was like, oh, well, well I don't know about that. So I hopped around to so many different ideas and really started exploring different things in high school. And it wasn't until I think I was in, I went from a Georgia high school system to a Virginia high school system. So mm. we're just going from a regular school day to- In Atlanta? Box. Yeah. Um, this was in Augusta, Georgia, or yep. Evans, Georgia. I yep. went to Evans High School. Yep. And then came to Moy High School in Norfolk, Virginia. And that was just a whole nother ball game. Again, really? you had that schedule. They were yeah. more pushy about the uh, AP classes. Right. Then even on top of that, you have people with 5.0 GPAs as juniors. And I'm like, how in the world? That does not happen in Georgia, or at least not with school I've been to. And so Absolutely. it was just a totally different accelerated track. So my guidance counselor, Debbie Walker, was like, I'm going to put you in AP classes your senior year. She's like, you're doing good in chemistry, it looks like. And you're doing good in math and English. So you, you're a good student. So I'm going to, we're just going to make sure you raise that bar so we can get you into college. And so I had already taken chemistry with one of my teachers, Miss Maudlin. And wow. she was a young, kind of vibrant uh, woman that really awesome. enjoyed chemistry and teaching it. And wow. so I think that's what rubbed off on me. Wow. And also kind of influenced me. Like, okay, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good in science. And I was also doing AP calculus and I was decent at that. And our teacher wow. Like, matter of fact, all my teachers during that time that took the AP classes, I took three, were all women. And so they all wow. I think, made sure the women, everyone in the classroom, but specifically the women, had a certain type of confidence, but also they wanted us to make sure that, you know, we succeeded. And so I think that's what influenced me at the beginning to kind of pursue a STEM degree once I got to college. And what did you major in? And what did you, what, real briefly, what did you go to like do, what job in STEM did you do? Or do. Yeah. So um, to give a little bit of trajectory. So when I got to college, got to the Denimus program, which is the Zorts National Institute of Mathematics and Applied Science. Mm -hmm. Say that two times fast. And <laughs> so that's a full ride scholarship at Norfolk State University. We have like a, a decent class of at least like 50 people. It starts off around 50. We might end with maybe 12 of us, but it starts off with 50. And, you know, we all study together, help each other. So in the beginning, I was a biology major, but then my chemistry teacher, uh, Dr. Katina Hall, was like, I think mm. you should become a chemistry major. You have really good analytical and critical yeah. thinking skills. And so I made that transition and I was like, OK, so I, I don't, unlike you, with Mr. Ferguson in physics, I was like with uh, Dr. Katina in chemistry. And I felt awesome. like that class, she really instilled upon us a confidence that I don't think you get taught in a lot of other, other different institutions. And to see a black woman with a PhD in the front teaching us chemistry and right. you know, thing from, you know, calorimeters to boiling point depression to you know, quantum, it was mm -hmm. just, it was amazing. And, and do it with swag too, right? She had plenty of swag. And look I think that was the start. And I was doing internships during the summer, chemistry internships. And I was like, okay, I think I want to do, because I still had medical in the back of my mind, maybe MD, yeah. PhD. And you know, Denise was really kind of sometimes pushed the medical. MD side on us, especially if you were like pre-med. I was chemistry pre-med. Really? And 
So I was like, okay. So I applied to MD PhD programs, didn't get into any of them. So mm-hmm. then moved to Hotlanta. You know, everything happened to me. Moved to Hotlanta. Not really. Um, struggled. Wait, 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 wait. What does that mean? <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. What does that mean? <laughs> you know how they say, like, don't come to Atlanta. We don't need any more people. But, you know, when you come to Atlanta, I think depending on your mentality, you can really make a lot of things happen or shake and move. But don't just go there to just have fun, party, do whatever. Like, sometimes you have to really go there with a plan or else you get the second. Oh, okay, got so it. So that's, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk so, about what distracted means later. Go ahead. Right. So I uh, went, um, I actually did not start off in my field at all. I actually worked in retail at Macy's and SunTrust. Um, so nothing to do with any of my degrees other than math. I could do math. Thank you anyway. for sharing that. <laughs> And then I finally worked at a biomedical device company called CryoLife, working on one of their dialysis products and realized, ah, okay, let me give the PhD a shot. So I ended up applying and got into the Cornell University in their biomedical engineering program. And I left and did that for five years and 10 months. I wrote a 226-page dissertation and published two um, articles on that work. I went on awesome. to do a postdoc for two years at University of Michigan. You know, go blue. Again, go blue. I just worked there. I had no affiliation. I care less yeah. about the, never the rivalries the right and all that kind of stuff. I could really care less. But I'll let Mr. Noah. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> and <joking>. then <laughs> I moved from there uh, to where I'm at now, which is doing a science policy fellowship um, in the federal government, specifically the executive branch. So um, my placement is at the National Science Foundation, and I do a lot of work in supporting programs that uh, support diverse innovation ecosystems, experiential learning, workforce development for emerging technology. So as you can see, my job has kind of been a little bit all over the place. It's been a journey really figuring out what I like, what really motivates me, what my passion is about, um, what interests me, and how can I really make an impact. And a lot of things came along that journey, which is, you know, advocacy and other things that I like to do. But that's kind of my job trajectory. So you said a lot of great things, role models, right? Having representation, having multiple women that were like, not just like women, but also like experts in their field, right? And having like mm-hmm. culture, right? But then also like when I, when and I really mad, I'm mad, mad kind of started like with the STEM advocacy, because like, I don't like putting people in boxes, because mm-hmm. I don't like being put in a box, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's very, very stemmy. That's very sciencey. Like when we're like science, we like, I only do that, you know what I'm saying? Or we glorify that because it makes us money, right? Or yeah. it gives us a certain type of status. I don't know if you've seen like Oppenheimer, but he was a mm-hmm. very flawed man because his his, you know, his his talents kind of blind him to like common sense, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And as smart people, as scientists, like we could kind of be clouded and not realize like it's okay to write a rap. It's okay to do poetry. It's okay to dance. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And like, you seem like a very, you embrace the whole you. And so the whole of you. And so um, what's a teacher tip would you give to like young, you know, t- or teachers out there who are with kids and kind of like, what did those role models do for you that was just so impactful? That's a great question. And I think for me, it started off as far as like getting the material, understanding the material, understanding why it's important, it's just that the instructors really made us see the applications of what we were learning. Mm. If you're sitting there and you're learning to learn things, and you will, it's not, everything I learned, definitely I don't use today, right? When was the last time I used a protractor or even a TI-85 calculator? Like that just doesn't happen in my everyday life. But I think it was not only the passion that they had you could physically see, but then realizing, okay, to keep my students interested, I need to relate it to some real world example or even some pop related example, popular culture. So that way they understand how this really fits into their everyday life. So my chemistry uh, professor in college, Dr. Hall, she was very, so for extra credit, what she would do is she would have us look at newspaper articles. And as we looked at them, we would analyze it and then write out the science in it. And yeah. that's how we get extra points on the test. And so at first I'm like, well, we just do extra credit. But after a while, I'm like, oh, this is an article about popping popcorn. Well, 
you know, that's pressure, you know, temperature, yeah. all different things. And like, okay, I see what I'm using actually applies in, in the real world. And so I think that's more of what brought me, kept me in, and also in pursuing my PhD, wanting to have that application of what can I do with this, you know, drug therapy, or even now my current job, what can we do now in executive to support certain research or initiatives to get certain workforce development initiatives across? Like what's going to be the impact? What's the real world application of these things? And so I think that's what really teachers should think about when they're teaching um, these subjects. And I know you asked for one tip, but I just You gave a tip, but you can give another one. Go ahead. (laughs) Um, Actually, this was for teachers and students. Um, Most students have come to me and they're like, I'm not grasping material or I have a tutor and things aren't just happening or whatever. And I think it really boils down to if you can't teach it, then you definitely won't and so I tell people all the time, you have to really be to like ace yeah. a test. You have to be able to teach yes. a peer exactly what you just yes. got from class. And what that's going to take is you writing on the board, on the chalkboard or Banded the smart up, board, thinking. or talking to right. your, your classmates and going back and forth. Like, did I say that right? Wow. Is this team right? And so teachers also have to realize when they're you can't just have students just regurgitate like they have to really be ingrained in the subject and be teachers themselves to really grasp the concepts and really ace it. That was an amazing tip. That was an amazing tip. That was an amazing tip. Uh, sure. And I think of Chris. I don't know if you remember Chris from Denimus. I mm-hmm. think you're Rainier, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The, those were my teachers. Those yes. were my student teachers. Yeah. I wouldn't have gotten, I wouldn't graduate without physics without them, right? Yeah. And just real briefly, like, how did they teach you? So like, kind of like characterize for the audience, those amazing teachers, like, how did they talk? How did they explain things? So kind of going back to what you were saying, like, if you don't, you really know it. What's yeah. the name? You remember the, uh, the lab teacher? Oh my gosh. She did the lab. She was a lab teacher. Um, Brandy. So my Brandy who did organic or which one? Doctor, no, not, no, not the, uh, chem- regular chemistry. She did for the regular kids, the the, the normal oh, kids. <laughs> doctor, oh, uh, doctor, oh my gosh, oh. But anyways, but yeah, anyways, Doctor Hall. I mean, even Doctor Hall, like, yeah. She really made me love chemistry because chemistry is the study of matter, and it's the most, it's the closest science to the most applicable because everything's chemistry, right? This is yeah. material science, you know what I'm saying? That's chemistry yeah. and physics, right? Yeah. Plastic, yeah. that's chemistry, right? And so yeah. kind of talk about like, how did those teachers simplify it for you when you was taught real briefly? I think for, sorry about that. No, you're good. Let me make sure, just turn this off so I don't go off the kid. Um, I appreciate it, thank you. I think, how they taught it or what I, I, I can remember that really kind of stood out for me was they just simplified it. Yeah. They, he would read it obviously in the textbook and that'd be one thing, but then they're like, okay, now let's break it down. What does this mean? What does that mean? Remember the lesson from last week and see how it connects to this week. Um, we're talking about something like boiling point depression or, or elevation like you guys know how you put antifreeze in your car well, what's that do? that's what yeah. this is i'm like oh that makes sense yeah or, or you know when something forms or, or liquid you know it's going to take the shape of that requires least amount of energy and that's a circle and you're like oh let me go look at the faucet sink oh yeah that is a, that's a circle that's like a teardrop that makes sense and right. so i think again having those real world examples I think in this day and age, it's more of a pop, sometimes pop culture examples. Like, what is it that's going on in pop culture that I can relate to my students for them right. to understand the material, which is another way of reaching them, which is completely fine. Um, but you just really have to simplify or relate things. And that's how people will grasp subjects. And outside of mm. that, you have to put that into practice. And how do you mm. put that into practice? You either, again, are at the whiteboard, at the chalkboard, <laughs> talking to yourself, talking to your friends, or you're yes. doing a bunch of practice problems until you really, really get it. Yes. Practice, 
I don't want to say it doesn't make perfect, but it makes permanent. permanent. So you have to do it over and over and over again to really grasp it. So chemistry is not easy. Math, not easy. all these physics, not easy. You just have to sit there and do problems and go to office hours. Talk to the professors. They actually will give you even more advice outside of just the classroom. So I think those are what's really stuck for me. Thank you so much. Awesome. Awesome. So let's let's go back. So let's go back before the degrees, before you got, you know, all the amazing knowledge and stuff. Do you consider yourself a geek? Do you consider yourself a nerd? Do you consider yourself awkward? Do you consider yourself an outsider? Do you consider yourself otherized? That's a great question. I do think I'll give myself nerdy and I give myself geek for sure. Um, I watch Bones, which is a show about a forensic pathologist um, that comes on. And it's just basically about solving like murders and stuff like that. And I will yeah. literally sit there in an episode or something will happen. And I'm like, there's no way that happened. That's not scientifically possible. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. That doesn't make sense. It would have to go through through this, or they would all have to bust through this container in order to retrieve da 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 da. Or, or I'm like, they're not using proper protocol. Like they should have gloves on or something. So I have those things that don't go on in mm-hmm. my head. I'm watching TV. So I think that's kind of nerdy, you know, geeky for sure. Um, I do consider myself in the beginning, I would say when I was younger, I was more shy. Um, so I wasn't the type of person that was necessarily always that super outgoing. Now I'm outgoing, but I'm very introverted. So as an adult, I prefer to stay home sometimes and then go out. Um, yeah. Like people now are like, oh, we don't see you in the city. And I'm like, you probably won't unless it's something very specific that I'm going to other than that I'm at home. Uh, reading, cooking, watching TV, making sure my plants don't die, um, or traveling for work or for, for leisure. So that's kind of what it is. But I do think um, sometimes being a scientist, people will automatically make those assumptions that you're one or five of those things, right? And it's true for some people. But I don't know, going to the HBC around so many adult Black people and being around the culture, you mm. can't help but come out and be this like empowering, cool, dynamic individual that just goes in these spaces and, you know, can really change them. I even say now, some scientists, the PhDs, we're, we're all a little weird in some kind of way to go through that process. Sounds a little off, but I think being myself, embracing the things that make me me um, has helped in this journey where I can relate not only to you know, maybe a top scientist in the field, but also talking to the people in my family and talking about the work I do or talking to an an artist, a creative about what I do. It allows me to have different hats and language that I can express myself and express, you know, stem to other people. (laughs) Thank you so much. And and the reason why I asked that question, because For me, you know, I had to embrace my nerd in order for me to embrace Mm. science, in order for me to Mm. really like, you know what I'm saying? Get the full circle. I was born that I felt I I used to watch Power Rangers, you know what I'm saying? Like anime, Mm. like things that I used to play with toys until I was like 12, honestly. Like Mm -hmm. I was very, very kinesthetic type learner. And then when I got in middle school and high school, I'm like not doing none of that stuff no more. I'm trying Mm. to dress like everyone else. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to play basketball. So mm-hmm. I literally stopped my nerd stuff and I put $20,000 in basketball because I'm trying to what? Look good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm trying to, you know what I'm saying? Feel good. Right. But yeah. deep down though, I'm in theater. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I'm literally, I be, I'm in IB theater. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like trying to be like the high school musical kid. The Drake, ja, you know, from uh, the white guy. Yeah. From, uh, I'm trying yeah. to be like him. Like, you know what I'm saying? Embracing yeah. that, embracing it. Like, but embracing it. Right. Yep. But now my kids, right, the kids I teach, the kids that I serve, right, they look at me and they're just lost because they have no idea what I am. <laughs> they don't know if I'm a jock. They don't know if I'm a geek. They don't know if I'm yeah. gay. They don't know if I'm straight. <laughs> they don't know if I'm, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm so eclectic. But what yeah. you said, the HBCU experience broke mm-hmm. all that, right? Because mm-hmm. you can be in Denimis and go to Echoes and still have Jordans on and still, you know what I'm saying, saying, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. and still be at the probate, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You can do all of that. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. And still be you. Yes, completely agree. But once we get out of that world, now we got to get back in those boxes, right? And so I hear, I, I mean, I remember Rainier. I tell Rainier's story all the time, man. Mm-hmm. Actually, you're the first person I'm telling the story to. Okay. Ooh. He took a break, and I hope he doesn't get mad, but he took a break, right? And I'm not saying, like, you know what I'm saying, why he shouldn't take a break, but Rainier was a genius. He mm-hmm. is a genius. Yes. Very smart. Yes. He just got, I mean, he just got, like, a, a, I think he just got his master's, his PhD, I believe. I remember so many friends that just didn't get jobs, right? Or they just didn't want to go into that field because they didn't see themselves in it, right? Or they wanted to teach because teaching, you know what I'm saying, brought them something. And so going back to what I was talking about, and I'm going to get to the question. Did the over, over, over push for STEM hurt other careers like teaching, right? So I read an article talking about how there's, that we can't, so, so there's this big push for STEM, but there's only 35% of the states that offer computer science classes and only 15, 50, 15 of the states offer AP mm-hmm. courses in computer science. Mm-hmm. And they said the main reason was because of what? Why do you think? Why they only offered it in certain states? Yeah, there's not enough access to those science fields yeah. and courses. Well, why do you think? Because there's not enough what? Teachers. Teachers. Mm-hmm. So the over push for science. Mm-hmm. I want to be computer science, be computer science. I don't want to be a teacher, but you need the teacher to teach the computer science. <laughs> and so it's like we just threw money. So that's what I just realized. We just threw money at some shit and said, mm-hmm. all right, we're trying to beat China. We're trying to beat Finland. We're trying to beat every other country who's killing us in science and making all these crazy technologies, right? But we don't really care about the teachers. I see what you're getting at. <laughs> so talk about like your teachers growing up. Like what mm-hmm. were your bad teachers like? You don't got to say no names, but like what were they like? Why were they bad? And why are they messing up this system? That's a good question. I'm trying to think. Hey, did I have bad teachers? And more than just like bad teachers, just more just like the the overall education system. Right? Yeah. So. Again, remember in the beginning, I was telling you, I went, I was at a Georgia public school system. Yep. Which was I was in New Orleans public school system, so I completely you know, understand. It's different, totally different, I think. Hyper different. I came to a Virginia school system. It was, you know, I'm like, what? We don't take the same class every day. They're like, And no. let me cut you off real quick. I came to Virginia because of Katrina. So I, I know exactly what you're uh-huh. talking about. I know exactly what you're talking so about. It was okay. a little bit of a, of a shock. You're like, am I going to the same class every day? No, am I seeing the same people? Or only time I did that was during my senior year, which was AP calculus that we had. And you have A, B, and B, C. We did A, B, C. So we took all of that every day for the whole year. So that was the only class my senior year that I, we were in the same class every day. Everything else is, you know, you go this on Monday, but then you go to this on Tuesday and then you go to, so it allows you to take more classes and get more credits and, you know, really good shining applicant on a college application. Mm. So I'm glad I made that transition, but I think the teachers or what I can remember of the teachers in the Georgia public school system, it was very, here's the information, you know, blase blah, like I don't remember a lot of their names i don't remember a lot of the interactions i have with them to me going to school was just like i have to go to school how did they make you feel at the time i also focused more on basketball that and mm. being around my friends in that arena that that was more important to me than my actual education there but once i got to virginia it completely flipped to where i was like i had, i really enjoy this stuff i need to focus more on my academics than basketball. I still played basketball all the way up, you know, to my senior year. Um, but near the end of it, I was like, I need to go fill out scholarship applications. So I'm not yeah. going to do this today. And so it was like a total mm. shift in mindset because of, I was like, I need to go to college. And now you're starting to think about things like, can my parents pay for college? No. So I need to get a scholarship. So that's, and basketball is not going to get me there. So, I'm, you know, I wasn't, Pro, like I'll be honest, I wasn't pro love. I was just playing it because it was fun and something I've done for so long. Awesome. But how am I going to financially provide for this super expensive education? And don't even get me started on the predatory loans and the student yeah. loan debt and what's yeah. happening. How 
companies are now moving towards like, is a degree even necessary for some of these jobs? And the answer <laughs> oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I heard my feelings when I saw that. <laughs> Different places have different access as well as mm. investment in education in certain people and in certain populations. Right. Even going to like where I used to live in Arizona, my brother went to high school at Tombstone and there was another high school called Buena, but Tombstone would be considered a STEM desert because there was no AP classes there versus mm. Buena had all the AP classes and they're only maybe 30, 40 miles apart. But it's really about that investment in that area and that education. And it's not equitable amongst all schools. It's not equitable amongst all cities, all regions in the nation. It varies. And so I was fortunate to be in a system where it worked out and was better for me. And so I think overall, so I got an alarm. That's the one one telling me to eat. Sometimes I forget to eat. (laughs) Wow. Um, I love it. I think it's important that people understand like everyone doesn't have the same type of education regardless of where you come from. And that's why I also encourage education outside of the traditional education system. I mean, TikTok isn't everything, but it's a place, right? It's a place to start reading books. Um, yeah, getting out the schooling, YouTube, schooling versus education. Listening to podcasts. Right. That an educated person isn't always from a traditional education. So I think that that's super important. But I think as far as bad teachers, it's just a bad system. And how we push education and we're teaching things like, why don't we teach about taxes? And why don't we teach about the stock market in school? Why aren't we teaching about things that are actually happening today? AI should be taught and, and be embedded in the curriculum. Semiconductors, like what are the things that are leading or would lead America into this innovation uh, leaders in in era. And so I think it's really, we really need an education reform, a huge, the whole child, no left, no child left behind. We, I, I don't think that was beneficial to anybody. Right. Absolutely. And school isn't for everyone. Just like college isn't for everyone. And I've met some amazing people who may not have finished middle school or high school, but they're educated in different ways. They know things that I don't. So we have to kind of broaden our mind what that is, but also understand if we're creating a workforce around a certain technology, not only do you need the teachers, you need people that are going to come up with the curriculum, but you also need the students that are going to then take that and implement it and you know, use it in a job. And so really, I think overall, just a bad system, but we have good teachers like yourself that are doing the work and inspiring child. Because a lot of times that one, Mm. you could be educating the next president and you don't even know, or you could be educating the next doctor that performs, I don't know, surgery space, who knows, right? Sometimes it doesn't always have to be that huge impact that we're looking for. Sometimes it can be a one-on-one basis. So overall, we just, we, we need to improve it. We definitely, as Americans, need to have a better system to better educate our people and better access and equity and understanding what that is, how learning styles. Some people are different, audio versus visual. Some people have different abilities or disabilities that makes it, you know, we have to broaden how we teach people. And so you said a lot of great things. You've been saying a lot of great things. We got Dr. Corey Grayson on the Calvin on the podcast. How you feeling today? I hope you're not feeling bored. I'm about to get you out of here. I just got a couple hey, questions. Man. How you feeling? I'm feeling good. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. I just, I'm just, I just really like, I don't know if you're like talking, like you're like trying to teach me something. Cause you're like really like, so <laughs> my uncle told me Katrina was one of the best things that happened to me because I got to get out of the Louisiana education system and experience mm-hmm. the education system. You literally just displayed. Right. Mm-hmm. I got access to Avid. Right. Mm-hmm. I, if, I, if I wasn't an Avid, I probably wouldn't be in college. I got access to mm-hmm. a counselor who literally did my entire college application with me, for me. Like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah. and I went to one of the most diverse high schools in the country. Mm-hmm. Named after a Confederate general is now is not they now, now changed it, right? But mm-hmm. you could think about like that Confederate general would be turned over his grave, think about like with his name. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the type of school I went to, right? Mm-hmm. I got the access, right? I got the equity, right? Because I was a kid from New Orleans who didn't know how to write. Mm-hmm. They put me on a 504 because I was so behind. 
I mm. love math. I was a, you know, I was a theater kid. You know what I'm saying? I just had some like deficiencies because of yeah. what I was talking about, right? Yeah. But one thing I think when we talk about like equity comes mm. advocacy, right? Because you don't really know what equitable is. You don't really know what people need until someone's saying they need that. I got to yeah. talk for those people, right? You got to yeah. put yourself out there, right? Sacrifice yourself for other people, right? So they could be a better future. So why did you do STEM advocacy? Why was that a uh, stage in your life, right? Because yes. I'm, I'm a STEM advocate, right? Because there's only 1% of businesses that are black, right? Yes. I'm an educating advocate because there's only 2% of black male teachers. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I'm losing. We're losing, right? But yeah. we still advocating, right? So why are you, yeah. why are you still... Why well, you still advocate even though we losing in the game a little bit? But we winning, and I'm, a, I'm not a loser though. I know you're not a loser. I'm just being facetious. Sure, so we're, we're, we're taking making strides in a lot of ways. And right. so I'll just start off with a couple years ago when I Googled the word scientist, I definitely didn't see a lot of people that look like me. Right. I think now when you Google the word scientist, I'm going to let the audience do a little homework. I think you'll see that it's, it's changed. A hey. little and so I think that has a lot to do with at least the millennial generation being more vocal, being more active, being more present on social media. Because that's unapologetic, where, unapologetic. Like, yes, very unapologetic. I you know a lot of academics, black academics who are like, I'm, I have, you know, my locks. I right. still have my two sweatshirt on. I'm going to still wear hats and teach. I'm going to still wear Jordans and teach. Like, I'm still going to be me. And that way they can see that. You know, if I can do this and be in this position, so can you. Right. And so, dang, I said all that and I forgot the question. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> I can help you out. It happened to me yesterday. It's all good. Okay. No, the question was just like, why advocacy? Like, why did you put yourself there out there in science? Yeah. So I brought that up because started off or going to an HBCU was one of the most biggest life-changing experiences for me. And I think having the teachers, being around the people I was around, the, the role models, the divine nine, I right. mean, it's so many different people. It's, and I don't want to just say black excellence, but it's just like black, just majesticness. You know what I'm saying? Realness. That it's realness. It's yeah. It's the culture. And so when you're in that space of feeling culturally safe, culturally seen, culturally understood, and then you go into a space yeah. where you're not, I had no choice but mm. to advocate for myself. Right. Because there wasn't a lot. But I came from a background that I think really equipped me with the tools right. that made me still be successful even in a predominantly white and Asian space. Environment, right. Yes. And so I think that's what made me speak up more. Like I had never even heard of the words microaggression. I had never heard of the mm. word stereotype threat or unconscious bias or imposter syndrome, whatever you want to call it. And I didn't learn about those terms until again, I went into this space that was different from what I was norm normally used to. Or custom. And that's when I was experiencing the things where someone would just say something out of their mouth, thinking they were being funny, thinking they were just, you know, just making a point. And it was actually offensive. Like Truth. say what? Like say what? Like, oh, you, you know, you came from a black school. Does your degree really count? Or They say that? They say that? Child, and they said more. Um, what they say? What they say, Corey? <laughs> what they say? You could say it. What they say? Jokes with the N word in it. Um, Bro. Comments about hair, you know, or some of my features, or just oh, let me, me being a woman. Like, if I say something, it must not be true or real. So let me go ask my the male person in the lab instead. Um, so undermining can be very demeaning. Like those were certain things that I was going through that I didn't really, I didn't have to go through that during my HBCU experience. And so for me being the type of person I am, and you know, growing up with an older brother, you know, cousins, like, you know, we go back and forth with each other. Like, you're not just going to talk about me and I'm not going to talk about you. Like we, we, exactly. we jokes, we go back and forth. So, but in this environment, 
It's hateful. I can't joke with you because it's not going to be fun. You know, the way I can't joke with you the way I would with my siblings because now I'm aggressive and now I'm angry. I'm angry black woman. So I really had to change the way that I approached a lot of situations that not only made me uncomfortable, but also made other people uncomfortable. Because I wasn't the only woman in the lab. I only wasn't the only woman of of color who was in the lab. Although I don't always like that term of color, but you know I what I'm yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And so I just started speaking up and it wasn't always the right reaction meeting. You know, I had to definitely mold and craft my responses more and more of a place, a place of calmness and a place of understanding peace. that this person, yes, peace, peace is a good word. Although sometimes it was like, I, I want to slap that. You, you could come from a p- place of love, but still <laughs> get your point across because you want to have peace for yourself. Exactly. And I'm not the type of person that just lets anyone walk all over me just because. And especially if, if you whack as hell, <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially <laughs> if you whack, right? And I feel like sometimes when we go to these places where we're new and we're the outcast or we're the other, or we're the only one, we feel like our opinion doesn't matter or it's not going to mean much, or I just have to do what everyone else says. And I'm like, no, I'm a, I'm an adult. And I got here on my own merits, on my own credentials. And you can say it's affirmative action, whatever. But I'm in the same place that you are doing the same things. And I even graduated before a couple of. Them. So, yeah, I think it became real affirming. And then I started creating this community of people of that felt the same. Right. That right. Were the same, felt the same. And I think that helped reinforce like, OK, we can't. I'm, I'm just not. It doesn't sit right in spirit to just sit back and do nothing. So I have to say something and I will continue to say something. So there are a lot of times where. Not only was I sticking up for myself, I was sticking up for another lab mate. There are times where maybe I even had approached, you know, someone in leadership with an uncomfortable situation that happened. And so I think that led more to my advocacy journey. My mom, I think, was really the catalyst of it all. From a very young age, she always spoke up for herself and made me speak, speak up for myself and put certain responsibilities on me that I didn't know if I was always ready for it. But she was like, no, you're going to make your own doctor's appointment. You're going to go to the car dealer. You're going to make yeah. sure they have something right. Like always about justice on my behalf. And, I, and again, that's what continued. And so I realized, okay, there's not a lot of us here. What can I do? What can, how can I be better? So as a grad student, how can I interact more with the undergrads? Right. And that's more of, I think, where that went for, for me. And even the grad students, like I'm just showing them ways, like you got to speak up for yourself more. Like that's yeah. not possible. Like, all right, I will go with you or we will think about this together because it's not just your cross to bear, it's ours. And we can't just keep letting certain injustices occur and not saying it and not saying that it's not okay. And so I've just carried that throughout my STEM journey, whether it's through talks, workshops, uh, books, yeah, all of that. I in even in the work that I actually do now, um, even you know my postdoc grad school, you're focused on your science, but you know I was in clubs, I was in organizations outside of that. Yeah, like was the I whole person. Sure. <laughs> I was making sure that advocacy just wasn't in in one science. space per se, but it encompassed a lot of what I did, whether it was for women, whether it was for STEM, for all people, black people. Like I was just making sure I could touch as much as I could in these spaces. And so Madam Curie, Madam Curie, you know, that is <laughs> she, you know, what I'm saying she's the one who studied pretty much discovered radiation. The reason why we have, uh, you know, radi- radiology. Mm-hmm. She wasn't going to get credit for her Nobel Peace Prize because she was a woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Her husband was going to. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's why we need advocacy. Because we can't let stuff like that happen, right? When you mm-hmm. advocate, you are talking for other marginalized people so yes. they can be heard. You understand yes. what I mean? And yeah. because she had a good husband who had power, who uses white privilege, his man yeah. white privilege, she yeah. was able to be the only woman in a modern physics mm-hmm. picture, right? That's literally, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, historical picture. And so, Corey, thank you so much. This was super, super dope. 
I I just want to just in on like what do you want people to get from the podcast? You know, I really want you to speak from the heart. Like you you really shout out a lot of like mentors, your mom, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you want people to get from the podcast? So very question. Well, one, your career is like a jungle gym. It's not like a ladder. So don't always look for that one place to be climbing up to reach a spot to beat someone else, right? It's more about having that curiosity, curiosity, the idea of risk and reward, the idea of changing and altering your path. And that's okay. I hope in the beginning kind of got that for me because mm-hmm. I wanted to totally something different than what I'm doing now. And I think just being open and being, you know, just curious about so many things has led me to a more passionate, fulfilling career. And so I think you should really take that from it. Yes. Definitely find your mentors, find your sponsors, and also find your community. You have to do the work to surround yourself with people that are going to uplift you, yes. support you, advocate for you, and also make sure that you're hopefully getting the same benefits, if not more, than what they have. And then lastly, well, two, uh, kind of two more things. Definitely mm-hmm. yourself. There's everyone else is taken. So you definitely have to do you. Be yes. I, everyone else is taken. Um, You've gotten to where you are because we are who we are authentically. Now, does that mean always authentically showing up to work? Not necessarily. I don't deserve all that. All that flat. But you can you get pieces of it, right? Because I'm being myself. And then last but not least, I think it's just important to not only realize, you know, your privileges, but also someone else's, but also maybe someone else's status that hasn't gotten there and you reach back, yes. you pull them up. And it's really not, we're not getting into a place of equity. We're not getting to a place where everyone can enjoy the benefits if we're not all uplifting each other up. And so I really think it's important that, you know, put the hater rate down, yes. put the jealousy aside. If all of that's still there, maybe do a little therapy mm-hmm. <laughs> and right. make sure you're bringing the next person with you. So I hope everyone can take those tidbits from this, this cast, podcast. And HBCUs do that very well. They they accept they, you for who you are. They yeah. accept your ugly. They accept your bad. They accept to, like Everything. I remember so many Everything. people who came in <laughs> who was this and they graduated like this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, like half my class, I'm like, some of me, I didn't think it was gonna make right, it. Right. <laughs> but I'm but calling your doctor too. Okay. But think about if it's like the situation where we're talking about where we're not being heard. It's tense, right? You feel like you have to be mm-hmm. something that you're not, right? Yeah. But you know, you should always have standards, right? There's more, yeah. you know, there's limits, you know, there's levels to stuff. But you're just talking about existing, right? You getting mm-hmm. judged because of your skin, right? Versus like your your character mm-hmm. and your actions, right? Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. Norfolk State that did a great job at that, obviously, because yeah. we're products of that. Yeah. And I think it's more than just like the black thing. It's just like that's equity. Like they just Humans, that's yeah. how you treat human beings. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, if you got a yeah. Dutch diversity of people, you got to accommodate for those people the best way you can. And it's not going to be easy, but you're going to celebrate when it's when when you get your successes. You're going to mm-hmm. cry when it's sad. You know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. we're going to, you know, we're going to ride or die, bad boys for life. And so Hello. thank you so much, Corey. I hope this was fun. I'm sorry it was an it's hour. Fun. I was trying to make it 30. Thank you so Life much for so blessing good. the brother, man. And yeah, just uh, anybody that you would recommend.